Uh, my name is Matt Gerard. I'm one of the lecture TAs here in Bio 152. When I'm not in here with you guys, I am a doctoral student in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Uh, I work on fish, and I do a lot of uh, morphological work, anatomy, particularly skeletal system, bone, um, a lot of the muscular system that's involved in feeding and feeding itself. We, taught, we thought today would be a good uh, lecture for me to give, given that we're going to talk about a lot of the different aspects of the skeleton, how muscles um, are organized, how they contract, at least within vertebrates. And then we're going to talk a little bit about predator-prey dynamics if we have time and how different muscles and muscle fibers uh, can impact things. So the skeletal system, most of you are all familiar with it. You're seeing it on the screen here on the right of this archer fish. It's going to provide the rigid elements that articulate uh, and transmit muscle forces so that we can move around, right? I can stand up here because I have muscles pulling on joints, uh, muscles allowing me to talk, things like that. They also, particularly for us in, in a terrestrial environment where gravity is acting really heavily on us, they're providing us some, some really nice body support. And there's generally three types of skeletons that we're going to talk about, at least in the confines of this class. The first of which is the hydrostatic skeleton. Then we'll have endoskeletons, which we're all very familiar with, and exoskeletons, which you generally see on uh, insects and things like that. Now, independent of how the differences among these skeletons, they are all serve a very similar purpose to use rigid elements to resist the pull of antagonistic muscles, OK? And we're going to talk about what an antagonistic muscle is in a little while. But despite all of the differences, we need something strong to resist the pull of a muscle so we can actually have movement. The last skeleton is, is the exoskeleton. And I actually brought a little friend that has an exoskeleton. And so this is called an arrow crab. And they are super fun, super cute, as you can see. Now, the exoskeleton of this crab, like I said, it has this big spike. But you can very easily picture another crab that has no spikes. We have a tremendous amount of variability in the exoskeleton across animals, particularly that are called invertebrates. They can be not only sh shape change, but you could have what they're made of. Some of them are made of chitin. Some of them are made of calcium. Some of them are made of silica or other compounds. And when they're living on land, the exoskeleton can actually prevent desiccation from the sun as it's burning on this, on this poor little thing, keeping water from coming out. Um, but there are some downsides in the fact that this can limit growth. Uh, the exoskeleton is very rigid. This little crab right here will actually have to shed that exoskeleton that he has. And they molt in a very cool way that I wish I could show you uh, to get a little bit larger, get it, allow their body to increase in size. They can, like I said, be impossible to repair. And crabs aren't necessarily the fastest uh, organisms on Earth. So part of the exoskeleton also impacts their ability to move in a really fluid way. But within that little crab, uh, we do have a whole bunch of musculature that is allowing that little guy to uh, move all of its exoskeletal parts. So we'll have flexors and extenders inside of all of those little limbs, inside its little uh, pinchers and things like that. And even though it doesn't necessarily look like something like that tiny little crab up there would have muscles, there truly are muscles in there. Uh, and muscles are where we're going to spend a tremendous time in this class talking about how they're organized, as well as uh, how they contract, and then go into some more information about muscles. Now, we know because of the hydrostatic skeleton that we brought up earlier that cnidarians uh, definitely have muscle. Uh, so kudos to all of you that picked that node on the, the phylogeny. Jellies and anemones definitely have both circular and longitudinal muscle uh, that allow them to move around. And usually they're moving themselves in sort of a, 
uh, Christmas tree kind of pattern of just like moving around, trying to capture things that are swimming by them um, so they can eat them. But there is one that does it just a little bit different, and it's, it's really a beautiful animal. Maybe the most graceful swimmer uh, in the animal kingdom. This is called Stomphia. It uh, lives in the Pacific in cold waters and regularly preyed upon by sea stars. Sometimes sea stars are really um, a pain, and so Stomphia can detach itself from the surface and gracefully, as you might agree, just swim away. Right? <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but if that swam past me in the water, and I'm in the water a lot, I would still be freaked out that this tube has decided to race me. Uh, but yeah, so don't think these circular and longitudinal muscles are not uh, allowing things to be swimming around. Hey everybody, welcome to Ichthyology Lab. This is the Kansas Fishes Lab, and traditionally, Leo and I would hand you a jar of unidentified Kansas fishes that you would get to identify to species. Now, I wasn't sure we were even going to be able to do this lab, given that we can't hand you a jar, but in light of our situation, I think I've come up with a video here that will allow us to achieve the same goals of identifying species of fishes in Kansas, but do it in a video format. So let's give it a shot. Here's our first unidentified fish. Many of you just jumped out and said, oh, well, that's a sturgeon. That's great. I hope many of you have said that. But there's three species of sturgeon that live in Kansas, and we need to figure out which species of sturgeon this is. A couple things to note. We have this large pectoral fin. All these scoots, a large caudal peduncle that we see here. And we have this filament coming off the upper lobe of the caudal fin. Also, if we zoom in on the head region, we can see that these barbels on the sturgeon are not smooth. They have little prickles on them. So let's jump in to the key in the fishes of Kansas and try and figure out which of the three species of sturgeon this is. So if we go to couplet one on page 43, in the key to the sturgeons, Asapenseridae, we can see that one species of sturgeon, the lake sturgeon, is differentiated first from the other two. Now the lake sturgeon has a caudal peduncle that's partly lacking scoots, and its length is much less than the distance from the origin of the anal fin to the insertion of the pelvic fin. We can see here that the caudal peduncle is indeed short, and it is shorter than the distance between the origin of the anal fin and the insertion of the pelvic fin. Now if we go look at our unidentified fish, it doesn't look quite like this lake sturgeon with respect to the caudal peduncle. The caudal peduncle's length is greater than the distance from the origin of the anal fin to the insertion of the pelvic fin. Much more reminiscent to what we see on these two species down here, with a much longer caudal peduncle than we see in this lake sturgeon. The last character that a lake sturgeon has is a spiracle, and that is a small opening above and behind the eye. And the spiracle on a lake sturgeon is right here. If we look at the rest of the couplet, we can see that the spiracle is absent in the other two species of sturgeon. If you zoom in, you'll see that there is no little spiracle or a little opening above and behind the eye in our unidentified sturgeon. So I think it's safe to say that we don't have a lake sturgeon here. So let's jump to couplet number two. In couplet number two, we get the other two species of sturgeon. Now the first character that's called out is that all four barrels are in a straight line near the midpoint of the snout in a shovel nose sturgeon, and the inner part of barbels are farther forward than the outer barbels in a pallid sturgeon. And we can see on the photos on the right, those four barbels are in a line, versus the middle two barbels are a little more rostral or a little more forward in a pallid sturgeon than they are in a shovel nose. That's not so easy to see in the photos that we have, so let's go to the next character. One thing I would like to call out, though, is our unidentified sturgeon has a character on the tail that should help you, and that is this filament coming off the upper lobe. That filament doesn't occur in a pallid sturgeon, and so I think we can safely say that our first unidentified fish is a shovel-nosed sturgeon. Nice job, everybody. Let's jump to our next unidentified fish.